So we get to the story of Miracle Rice, um, the amazing story of Miracle Rice, and uh, that your authors talk about, Bell and Ashwood. And uh, it's an example of what Esther Bosarup was talking about, how, uh, how the adoption of technology is not necessarily uh, technological innovation. So, um, you know, first of all, uh, the idea that a lot of the population growth uh, that's, hap that's happening in the world is taking place in countries that depend on, on rice agriculture, all right. Uh, in, in Asia. So here we go. So what happened? What's the story of Miracle Rice? Um, well, during the 1960s and 70s, there was something uh, called the Green Revolution. Now, the, the Green Revolution was basically an effort to uh, intensify agriculture um, that uh, uh, was swept right through a lot of the developing countries. Um, I think that would be, if any of you are doing option one uh, for the rest of the term here, and I have to make, I'm gonna make up a test of uh, identification and definitions of terms. I think that might be one of the terms I'll put on there would be the green revolution. What was the green revolution? And uh, so you may have to do a little, little looking little research on that, find out what the Green Revolution was. Anyway, um, this Green Revolution, and the Green Revolution uh, emphasized uh, more, like I said, is emphasizing a more intensive approach to agriculture. Um, that meant mechanization, it meant irrigation, it meant the use of pesticides, it meant the use of fertilizer, uh, and so on. And it also meant the introduction of uh, different hybrids that were going to increase uh, yields, increase rice yields. Um, also led to other kinds of development projects like the, uh, the building of roads and so forth, rural road construction. Uh, etc. So this green revolution and the emphasis on these the, these more intense intensive uh, agricultural uh, techniques, uh, farming techniques, uh, did lead to a, a two point six fold gain, right, or increase in agricultural output between. 1950 and 1984. Okay, um, now that's important because uh, you know, the, like I said, a, a great uh, portion, a vast portion of the world is dependent on rice agriculture, and in the, it's in those places where we're seeing some of the highest rates of global population increase as well. Um, so the per capita world. Uh, grain harvest rose by about 40% overall. Much of that gain was in rice production and, uh, as we said, crucial to the diets of billions of people across the world. Um, your authors tell us that the average worldwide consumption of rice is about 145 pounds per capita per year. Um, and, for example, in Bangladesh, uh, the average person eats about a pound of rice a day. So, and, and, and again, it's in these rice-producing countries that uh, most of the world's population growth is taking place. Um, a lot of these countries have, uh, have and had uh, very little land uh, left that could, be, that could be brought into rice production. So the issue of increasing the rice harvest uh, was clearly important, all right? So that brings us to uh, something called the International Rice Research Institute. A lot of the success in increasing this uh, global yield of rice has been attributed to the work of the International Rice Research Institute. And we want to point out that the success didn't come 
without its problems, without its unforeseen problems, okay? So the International Rice Research Institute, otherwise known as the IRRI, or I like to just call it the ERIE, okay? So if I refer to the ERIE, I'm referring to the International Rice Research Institute. Um, the, uh, the ERI, the International Rice Research Institute, was founded in the Philippines in 1959 uh, with the goal of increasing rice production. And their approach was to develop new rice that could accept higher rates of fertilizer, um, fertilizer application, and also be suitable for mechanical harvesting, for mechanical cultivation and mechanical harvesting. Um, most of the local rice varieties that, that we would have found uh, across the world at that time um, were, were, were not necessarily suitable for uh, mechanical cultivation. Uh, a lot of local rice varieties at that time were susceptible to something called lodging, okay, lodging, uh, uh, L-O-D-G-I-N-G, lodging. And what lodging means, what lodging refers to, is that uh, the plants, when they get too tall, they, they fall over, okay. Um, they fall over from growing too tall. There was a lot of local varieties of rice that were susceptible to, to lodging, okay? Now that's not particularly a problem when you're harvesting rice by hand, right? It's not really a big deal. But when you want to harvest rice mechanically, uh, then it does become a problem. Um, uh, so, uh, before mechanical combines could be used, you had to come up with a new variety of rice that wasn't uh, susceptible to lodging. And lodging actually gets worse. You know, when you use chemical fertilizers, lodging actually gets worse because you get this, you know, this like surge of nutrients and that makes the, makes the, the, the uh, plant, you know, grow um, really fast. And, um, uh, in response to all these nutrients that it's, that it's exposed to. Hold on. Okay, so scientists uh, from uh, Erie, from the Erie, uh, do what scientists do, and they, they find a uh, shorter statue variety of rice, um, and they create a hybrid. Uh, with conventional rice, and that's something they did in 1966. So they cross uh, conventional rice, which is prone to lodging, with this lower stature uh, rice, and um, that they create a brand new hybrid of rice that is going to be more suitable to uh, applications, heavier applications of fertilizer, and also now, because it's going to be less susceptible to lodging, is going to be a little more amenable, right, to mechanical harvesting, right? And they call this hybrid, uh, here, hold on a second now, they call this hybrid IR8, right, IR8, IR8, or Miracle Rice. Okay, Miracle Rice. There you go. I R E, Miracle Rice. Um, and then farmers now across Asia, across southern and southeastern Asia, give up their local varieties of rice. All right. Now, before we go on here, I want to set it up. I want to set something up. What are going to be the consequences of the widespread adoption of this uh, uh, miracle rice? All right, and we're going to have four, um, maybe five, but at least four really important consequences of it all. One of them is going to be that it's actually going to lead to increased pest damage. Okay, it's going to lead to increased pest damage. That's number one. 
Number two, it's going to lead to a loss of genetic diversity. Now that's important, right? It's going to lead to a loss of genetic diversity. Um, number three, it's going to actually um, undermine the quality of the diet of people in a lot of places. And then uh, fourth, it's going to in actually increase social inequality. So that's something we referred to before when we were introducing Esther Bosera. Um, so let's look for those four things, right, as we go through the rest of the discussion here. So we have farmers, right, giving up their local varieties of rice, right, farmers in southern and southeastern Asia giving up their local varieties of rice, uh, and they start buying and planting miracle rice, all right. Now, the yields go up between 1968 and 1981, according to your authors, right, the, uh, the average yields go up by like 30%. Right. But again, bringing with it all different kinds of other problems, right? Now, the first one we mentioned in our list was the increase in pest damage. So why did Miracle Rice lead to pest damage? Okay, um, here, this is why. So why more pest damage? Well, you know, first of all, farmers used to uh, save their own seed, right? They used to keep their own seed. Um, and maybe you remember we started to watch a film right before all this happened. It was Michael Pollan's film. And uh, you saw, even in the United States, how, you know, Monsanto's control of uh, soybeans, you know, led to uh, pat patenting, you know, uh, on these varieties of soybeans and how farmers basically lost control over their seeds. And so we have something similar going on here. Farmers used to keep their own seeds uh, and they, so, they used to select their seeds, right? The kind of rice that a farmer would grow. Uh, they grew um, uh, varieties of rice that were more suitable, right? To local conditions, okay? Um, now, with the coming of uh, IR8, right, with the coming of Miracle Rice, farmers are giving up their local varieties of rice and they're adopting this, this new hybrid, okay? And so we have a huge, huge, huge percentage of land being planted with, uh, with Miracle Rice, right? And they're now, so they're now planted with the same variety. So one of the reasons why it leads to increased pest damage is you got to think about it like this. You might have you know, one local variety of rice might be more susceptible to a certain kind of pest, right? But other local varieties uh, may uh, not be, okay? So in other words, if you had pest damage, if you had like an outbreak of some kind of pest uh, uh, problem, right, that uh, there was a chance that it would be much more localized and you would still get you know, successful harvest in other parts of the of the country because farmers were growing different varieties of rice that weren't susceptible to that local pest. Well, now you have one kind of rice being planted all over the country, and now there's a, uh, I'm just going to say, there's now a continuous field <clears throat> for an, a, an outbreak of uh, pest infestation. And it could now spread through the entire country. You follow that? I hope you follow that, right? Uh, so pests can, you know, flourish in this new kind of environment. And what that's going to lead to is, uh, you know, the, now the search for different kinds of pesticides. So let's, let's, uh, let's hold off on that a little bit. Now, how, how farmers used to deal with the problem of pests is, um, you know, they would grow um, maybe maybe one or two crops of rice a year, okay? They would grow maybe one or two crops of rice a year. And in between their crops, the way that they, the way that local farmers would basically deal with pests is that they would, between crops, they would drain their patties and completely dry them out. Uh, and so uh, usually uh, th this, this, 
old pattern of drying out the fields right between um, crops. They would dry out their fields at least once a year would interrupt the life cycle of pests. But since now we're trying to increase rice harvest right through using miracle rice um, and we're also you know using fertilizer and so on uh, instead of one or two crops a year now we want two or three crops a year so that cycle of draining the paddy and drying it out and interrupting the life cycle of the pest uh, now ends and farmers are adopting uh, use of pesticides right because they're because now they're planting two or three times a year um, okay everybody everybody hope everybody's with me here so far um, so farmers you know, stop that sort of traditional practice and they begin applying uh, newly available pesticides um, but as usually happens uh, you know Darwin has a hand in it so pests start developing resistance right they start re developing resistance to these pesticides so what that starts another cycle of hybridization so now the international rice research institute uh, has to come up with a new uh, a new variety of rice uh, that uh, you know is going to be able to handle all the pesticide and, and, and is going to be resistant to certain kinds of pests and so on um, and so we get this kind of arms race going on now, right? You have, you know, this, this pest cycle, um, you know, pests adapt to pesticide. So now you have to develop new pesticides. And then you also have to develop new varieties of rice that are resistant to um, pests and that can take fertilizer and all that stuff, right? And it just starts this whole, this whole cycle. Um, so the international rice in the International Rice Research Institute developed a brand new hybrid and then more after that, right? All the way up to, we started with IR8, remember, all the way up to IR26, okay? So this new hybrid could handle grasshoppers, right? But it was easily flattened in the wind, okay? Now, uh, this le leads to a problem. So there's, now this new rice is easily flattened in the wind. Now, why is that a problem? Well, again, we're, we're using mechanized harvesting, right, and mechanized cultivation. So just like lodging knocks that plant over, makes it difficult to harvest by machine, well, if plants are getting knocked over by the wind, it's going to flatten them out, and they're, you know, they're going to be, um, you know, difficult to harvest using machines, okay? Uh, so uh, meanwhile, though, farmers had adopted IR8, and so we mentioned before the loss of genetic diversity, right? So here's the other problem connected with the loss of genetic diversity. You know, the first problem was when farmers were planting diverse, diverse types, uh, genetically diverse types of crops, it kept pest infestations more localized. The other problem with the loss of genetic diversity is well we got to create hybrids right but what are we going to create the hybrids with we have to find species of rice that we can you know uh, hy hybridize uh, to uh, solve the problem that we're facing all right so they had to now come up with uh, a <laughs> a plant right a, a rice variety that was going to be resistant to wind damage and uh, that was hard to do but researchers, they go to Taiwan, uh, the, the authors tell us, they go to Taiwan, they find this wind-resistant variety, or they knew of a wind-resistant variety, but um, that variety had disappeared because all the local farmers were growing rice from the International Rice Research Institute. And no one had bothered, right, to keep the seam, this, 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 Right, this wind resistant variety of rice. Okay, so the problem was the loss of genetic diversity. Eventually, the uh, eventually the uh, Erie right finds a variety that they could use, and they develop IR thirty six. Right, so we went from IRA to IR twenty six to IR thirty six. 
Four years later, there's um, a problem with these locusts, right? These brown locusts that had evolved, uh, uh, you know, and that evolved pesticide resistance and and so on, and began attacking that that crop. So in a few years, you get the idea. In a few years, we got, again we got this kind of arms race going on. And in a few years, the International Rice Research Institute is up to IR-72. Okay. All right. Everybody good? So we talked about increasing pest damage was one of the, one of the consequences of the adoption of uh, IR-8, of Miracle Rice. We had a loss of genetic diversity, right, um, which led to other problems. Okay. Uh, and then we also mentioned in the beginning, we said something about how the quality of diets, right, for many local farmers, for many local people, uh, was undermined because of the, you know, using this new rice. And it wasn't necessarily because the rice wasn't nutritious. But, you know, think about, we're going from a system of very labor-intensive peasant agriculture to one of uh, more highly uh, mechanized, highly capital-intensive, uh, more uh, industrial form of farming, right? And so here's the problem with diet. Uh, what farmers used to do in their rice paddies was they used to, you know, as long as the paddies were full of water, they used to raise fish in the rice paddies. And so the, the paddy fish were a very important source of protein to a lot of people. Uh, with the miracle rice and the fact now that we're, we're not planting uh, once or twice a year, now we're planting two or three times a year and we are uh, using pesticides, right? And we're using these artificial fertilizers uh, we can't raise paddy fish anymore. So the farmers lose their ability to grow paddy fish. And that was one of the major sources of protein for many uh, rice farmers, um, you know, coming from the fish that they were raising in their rice paddies. Um, okay. So that means that, that you know, we are, we're, we're developing IR8. We're developing miracle rice to solve uh, a problem, a food problem. And uh, it actually led to lower nutrition levels, right? So it actually leads to lower nutrition levels for local farmers. The quality of their diet declines, okay? Um, and then, you know, uh, finally, we have the idea of uh, inequality, right? How did this actually increase social inequality? Um, well, the new rice required more capital, right? And inquired, it required a higher investment uh, from farmers. Um, uh, so they had to invest now in, you know, they were giving up their old traditional ways of farming um, to increase yields. Uh, uh, and now instead of, you know, the old ways that they used to do things, which were suitable to their local circumstances, now they had to invest in fertilizer, they had to invest in pesticides, they could, they weren't keeping seeds anymore, they had to, uh, they had to invest in hybrid seeds, they had to invest in farm machinery, uh, and the cost, right, all that cost uh, actually uh, forces, right, actually forces many of uh, like small independent farmers out of the game and forces them off the land in, in a lot of ways similar to what's happened to the small family farmer in the United States, right, being pushed out of the, the market, you know, by large, um, large, uh, more, more industrial, you know, more, bleh larger, more industrialized um, units, right, like, like big companies, okay, and that leads to poverty, right, it led to poverty, um, far, these farmers being forced off the land, now they had no livelihood, and um, because the larger farmers, because the larger scale farmers who could weather that, or, you know, handle that 
uh, level of investment, you know, uh, were uh, investing in mechanized farming that wasn't really labor intensive. Uh, it meant that these dislocated farmers couldn't even sell their labor, right, as farmhands, you know, or even become tenant farmers uh, to support themselves. So, you know, it eventually dislocates people from the land and, uh, uh, you know, creates a, a situation where uh, people are without a livelihood. Now, um, there's a bit of a, a similarity between that. If we look at the history of the United States, and we could say, well, the same thing or something similar about the mechanization of farming and what happened to tenant farmers in the South, right? You know, it had a lot of uh, tenant farmers in the South who were engaged in, uh, you know, cotton cotton production, cotton raising. And when you invent the mechanical uh, cotton harvester, right? When you mechanize um, uh, cotton uh, cultivation and you no longer now rely on that person picking the cotton by hand, um, well, that just displaced, you know, all kinds of people from the land. Now, what they did was head north. They headed to the to the cities. They headed to the industrialized north. So they were going, like, think about African-American tenant farmers in the south, um, you know, between the 1930s and the 1960s. They're, they're moving uh, north to places like Detroit, right, and Chicago and, and Pittsburgh uh, to uh, now become... Uh, industrial wage workers, right? And we have something similar here. People are dislocated from the land. Where are they going? Well, they're going to the cities. And it's going to lead to a flooding of the urban labor market. Okay. So, the, so that actually the, the, uh, the, the adoption of these, um, you know, hy hybrids of rice, uh, create all these other spin-off problems that that makes one wonder whether or not you know people were actually better off uh, under you know under traditional ways or traditional modes of production okay so let me let me take a little break right here for a second